So will a public inquiry be called into foreign interference in Canada? Well, the independent special rapporteur David Johnston will answer that question on Tuesday. But in the meantime, the Globe and Mail has published yet another revelation. The story says, quote, Canada's spy service sought an electronic and entry warrant to monitor former Ontario Cabinet Minister Michael Chan in the lead-up to the 2021 federal election. But it took several months for then-Public Safety Minister Bill Blair to sign off on the clandestine surveillance of the influential Liberal Party power broker. When asked by the Globe about the apparent delay, Blair said, quote, I'm not going to discuss that because I took an oath not to do that and I'm not going to do it. And you have your facts wrong. That was Bill Blair speaking to the Globe and Mail. Well, multiple media reports say the Canadian Security and Intelligence Service has been investigating Chan for years over his alleged ties to China's Toronto consulate. Chan has repeatedly denied any wrongdoing. He is calling for a public inquiry into what he calls the, quote, profoundly disturbing activities of CSIS, its leadership, and its employees. Here to discuss this story is Richard Fadden. He's a former CSIS director and a former national security and intelligence advisor. Uh, Mr. Fadden, thanks for coming in. Good to be with you. Uh, so according to this Globe report, it took Bill Blair four months to sign off on the CSIS warrant. What is your assessment of that delay? Well, as is the case with you, I don't have all the facts. But if I take as given what's in the Globe and Mail article, I think it's unconscionable. Um, you know, there's a whole process set down in the law and in practice reviews within CSIS, the director signs off, there are interdepartmental reviews, the Department of Justice is involved, public safety is involved. So by the time it hits the minister, there are a lot of people who agree this is important and relatively urgent. So I cannot imagine why a minister would sit on it for four months without going back to the director and saying, I need more information or I don't agree. He's perfectly entitled to say no, but the system doesn't work if anybody in the system just sits on things. Now, I don't know why he did that, and I gather from the media that he's not going to tell us why, but four months is too long. Is it possible there was a back and forth there between the minister and the director of CSIS that maybe we just don't know about because you know, maybe the source doesn't know about it? I mean, would that yeah. be the normal practice It's absolutely, there? absolutely possible. I mean, every warrant request that goes forward has a different level of urgency. Mm. You know, for example, on the terrorism side, you don't fool around. Right. And I, I cannot imagine Mr. Blair would fool around with a terrorism request. But the minister, the, 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 the director has the right to demand a meeting with the minister. If he's really concerned, he can speak to the NSA. He can ask to see the clerk. There are any number of things he can do to register his concern that the file isn't moving. We just don't know whether he did or not. But leaving it with the minister for four months also, from the perspective of a deputy head, is not a nice thing to do because it endangers the minister, small p, politically. So without knowing all of the facts, I just come back to my basic view that four months is too long. Right. This warrant, though, to my amateur view, seems, seems quite significant. CSIS wanted to basically sneak into the home and office and maybe the car of a former Ontario Liberal cabinet minister and plant bugs and listening devices. So that sort of intrusion would require a, a, a great level of scrutiny by the minister, would it not? Could that explain the delay? No. It's the sort of warrant that would go to a minister any number of times during the year. I understand that the... The, the bugging of a cabinet minister? A no, I was, going to, I was coming to that. Okay, I was sir. going to say, this sort of warrant comes to a minister any number of times, and there should be a relationship between the minister and CSIS, which would tell CSIS what the minister wants in the warrant application. Going to a, a, a provincial minister, I cannot imagine easily that the minister would look at this without referring it to PMO for their views. For all I know, PMO has to approve, but at a minimum, he would want PMO to be aware of it. So there, there's sort of an understanding, I think, in the system that a certain category of people, um, very senior members of the judiciary, senior members of the media, uh, senior members of uh, the church, politicians, they get a special look-see because being wrong means all sorts of, of mm -hmm. fallout that's not very desirable. So if this is the case, and I have no reason to believe that it's not, CSIS should have looked at this from every possible angle before it hit the minister, as would have the minister's department, as would have the Department of Justice, and probably as would have the NSA. There, there's a suggestion from the source in the Global Mail article that perhaps that, that there's a view in CSIS that there is a hesitancy here because uh, Mr. Chan was a major organizer and a fundraiser for the Liberals in Ontario, certainly at the provincial level. Do you think that could have been a factor in the minister's decision making here as, as suggested by this article? 
I really don't know. I mean, again, we're running up, unless you're holding out on us, we don't I know. definitely we not. We don't know. No. <laughs> so, I mean, are political considerations unreasonable for a minister to take into account? No, they are not. Are they, is it reasonable for a minister to make these, consideration, these considerations determinative? I don't think that's fair. So I would argue that if this is the case, the easy, acts, the easy way for the minister to deal with his political concerns would have been to go to PMO which he may have done in any event. So I really don't know. I can understand that from CSIS's perspective, going to a provincial politician is sensitive. And they would have taken that into account as they pushed it up the system. Michael Chan's been on CSIS radar for a while, according to a lot of public reporting. Uh, you know, going back to 2015, that apparently it was under physical surveillance for quite some time. If there's this level of interest in an individual by CSIS to the point that they want to bug their house and office and all of these things, because they believe they're involved in some level of foreign interference, how could it go on for at least eight years now without there being some sort of action here? Well, it is a long time. I'll be the first one to grant you. Uh, foreign interference isn't quite like terrorism or traditional espionage. There's no, sh you know, there's no smoking gun. Right. Uh, because it's all taking place in conversations within people. The individual's concern, uh, be it Mr. Chan or anybody else, would be very cautious. A lot of these conversations would take place, you know, in social settings. So unless you're actually there and you're lucky, it's actually hard to catch people at this which is one of the reasons why not just in this country but in the, the, the country of our allies it's difficult to grab them it takes some measure of luck or a great deal of patience you know uh, there have been leaks uh, for for quite some time now in a n normal criminal case an information to obtain or a search warrant you can go to court make an argument you can get that you can't get a CSIS warrant right like the the fact that this was leaked feels like a bit of an escalation how do you characterize the significance of this sort of a breach of national security laws and and what do you think is happening inside CSIS right now that this has come out well I can't think that CSIS is very happy about this I mean CSIS really does operate more effectively under the cover of darkness if I can put it that way the big difference though between a criminal warrant mm -hmm. is that you don't need the permission of a minister in fact it's improper right. to involve a minister CSIS, because its measures are so intrusive and because the threshold is lower, you need the approval of a minister. So I would say that, you know, virtually every case that I've been aware of when I was in the system, ministers dealt with them fairly quickly or they told you, I have a problem, I'm not going to deal with this. So not dealing with something for four months, to my mind, is very serious. Uh, our allies must be wondering what in heaven's name we're up to. CSIS would be very frustrated, and I think people elsewhere in the system who are concerned about foreign interference. Um, the bad side of all of this, to be fair, is that having been mentioned a great deal in public, uh, Mr. Chan has not had an opportunity everywhere to sort of nope. refute any of this. Um, so that's the advantage sometimes of CSIS operating under the radar. People don't have to defend themselves in public because they aren't put up to public, uh, public accusations. So this has all become very, very complicated. I think within CSIS right now, they must be wondering, you know, how it's going to develop. I gathered that David Johnson is going to report sometime next week on whether Tuesday. all of this is going to require a public inquiry. I think this is just one more small example of this complicated file where we absolutely need a public inquiry to find out what has happened. It is not a good thing that every 10 days, Bob Fife and Stephen Chase publish an article based on leaks of national security information. It is not in the national interest that, hap that this happened, but surely it's in the national interest for us to find out what is going on. So if, if David Johnston on Tuesday uh, does recommend a public inquiry, which I know you've advocated for, what, what are the big questions you think he needs to uh, seek to answer? Well, aside from going through the, the a significant number of discrete questions that you've talked about, others have talked about, I think he needs to ask, you know, have we defined foreign, inter foreign interference properly in this country? Mm. Uh, should it be a crime? Should it not be a crime? To whom should it apply? Should it only be China? Should it be anybody in engaged in foreign interference? Should it also be non-state actors, not just states? Uh, having resolved this to one degree or the other, does CSIS have the right tools to deal with this sort of thing? Are other actors potentially more at play than they should be now? Do the police have a role or not? There are the, so there are a bunch of detailed questions based on the specific accusations, allegations, and then some of these broader sort of meta issues that we really do need to discuss. I mean, the Prime Minister has resolved the issue of the threshold of reporting when there's a threat yep. against parliamentarians, but what about threats against 
you or me or the Chief mm. Justice of Alberta or the Cardinal Archbishop of Quebec. You know, these are not insignificant issues. Um, all of these need to be put into a pot and stirred carefully by a public inquiry. Richard Fadden, as always, thanks for your time. My pleasure.